Okay, uh, good morning everybody. I hope you're all well rested after the tour yesterday and the dinner. And I'm happy to begin this uh, morning session with uh, Laszlo Erdos, who will tell us about condition numbers and eigen eigenvector overlaps for random matrices. Okay. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for the organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, at the beginning, I was a bit hesitating to come, but I'm, I'm happy to see that everything is very peaceful. Um, so I will talk about another aspect of random matrices. This is about eigenvectors and the condition numbers. I will go a bit slow at the beginning, and then technical things will not be covered at the end of the day because uh, I have many more slides than I could be able to present. So these are joint works, several papers which will be presented in a joint works with my former students and postdocs and, and so on. So let me first introduce the, the basic object. This is what we call the IID random matrices <coughs> plus, plus the formations. So the IID random matrix is exactly what the name says. This is the non-Hermitian analog of the Wigner matrices. Interestingly, it doesn't have a special name. We have the Wigner matrix, Ginebra matrix, GU, and so on. This type of matrices do not have a, this, this kind of ensemble does not have a special name, so we just call them IID random matrices. It's an N by M <coughs> random matrix. Each matrix element is an independent random variable, identical distributed. It can be real or complex accordingly. And many of the theorems are split into two parts. There's a complex and a real version. Don't worry about that so much. This is not the important thing here. The important thing, co in contrast to the Wigner matrix, is that these are really independent, so there is no Hermitian symmetry. The x12 and the x21 are independent uh, elements. There are some conditions. Uh, normalization conditions, so we'll do it in such a way that the matrix elements have zero expectation. Uh, the matrix elements are scaled by 1 over square root of n. This is the normal scaling, so that makes the matrix x as an order 1 matrix, even as n goes to infinity in the sense of norms. So therefore, the matrix elements in distribution written like 1 over square root of n times a, times a model distribution chi, model random variable chi, which is an order 1 random variable and satisfying to natural normalization conditions. And it has some, uh, some, some technical moment conditions. Basically, every moment to be finite. Uh, this can be relaxed a bit, but let me, let me not worry about that. Now, <coughs> as I said, that this matrix, this ensemble does not have a name. I just call it IID matrices. The Gaussian version of that, when this random variable is a Gaussian, then, then this is a famous Ginebra ensemble, which I guess everybody has heard of. Now, as I said, the normalization guarantees that the matrix of, uh, that, that this matrix is roughly of order one. So this, for example, you can compute. If you, you can convince yourself, <laughs> you can just compute the trace of the xx star. Normalized, then it turns out to be an expectation to be one. It's a simple calculation. It just shows you that the matrix is roughly, the spectrum of the matrix is roughly of order one. Now, <coughs> very often we will consider the deformed version of that. So what I told you before is called the IID random matrices. Now we will call the deformed IID random matrices, which is just, we will just written the following with X plus D, where X is an IID matrix, as I wrote before. And these are deterministic matrix, which is also of order one. If you wish, you can think in such a way that, that, that if I drop the condition that the expectation of the matrix elements is, uh, is zero, uh, then, then I can I, I can I can just put the, the expectation of the matrix elements matrix into the D. That's a deterministic matrix, and then for from any matrix uh, whose matrix elements did not have zero expectation, I can write it in that form. But it's better to think about in this deformation way that that you have the previous slide again. Okay, um, so it's better to think in such a way that. It's better to think in such a way that these are deterministic matrix, any matrix, order one matrix, and then you add to that an IID uh, perturbation. So as I said, this is one of the motivation that you, in this way, you can drop the expectation condition, but that's not the main motivation. There are too much more important motivations to study that, uh, this type of matrices. Uh, one of them is, is from statistics. This comes from the so-called information plus, plus noise, noise model in statistics, and there are many, many references that may not side them in details. So in this way, the D is the, the data matrix, um, actually the, the, the presumed data matrix, but then usually in, a, in an observation, you don't get exactly what you want. You get some noise on, on top of that. And the easiest way to, to, to model the noise is just an IID uh, matrix. This is one way of thinking about it. This comes up very often in, in statistics. 
at the important message, moral message here, that in these models, in the statistics application, the noise is sort of the bad guy. So we would like to understand the D, but unfortunately we don't have exactly a D. There are all kinds of errors, and the errors are included in the, in the X. This is one aspect. Then uh, there's a very different aspect <coughs> uh, which, which uh, prompts you to study the, the uh, deformed IID matrices. This comes from numerics, where the message is exactly the opposite, where actually the noise is a good guy for you. So let me explain that. So it's very well known that for a, for a general non-normal matrix, A, yeah, so a very general, uh, absolutely general matrix, typically it's a non-normal matrix, the spectrum of that is very unstable. I mean, this everybody learns in linear algebra 101. You, you, you get a Jordan block, that's the typical example, and then you put that small perturbation. So the Jordan block has a, has a very, very degenerate, a large Jordan block has a very degenerate eigenvalue at zero. But if you perturb the Jordan block a little bit, then the spectrum gets, gets this, this high degeneracy eigenvalues get perturbed by a huge amount. So this is an extreme sensibility. Of, uh, of a typical matrix, I mean, the Jordan block is a very extreme situation, but it's a typical um, phenomenon that, uh, that a non-normal matrix, the spectrum of a non-normal matrix is very unstable under perturbation. It's very different from the Hermitian matrix. The Hermitian matrices are good guys, or even normal matrices are good guys, non-normal matrices are the bad guys, uh, from numerics point of view, stability point of view. Now, how to, how to quantify this sensitivity? There are many different ways of doing that, but the standard way in, the, in numerics is called the eigenvalue condition number. It has many other names. It's done in the one possible definition of the following. For any given matrix A, you try to diagonalize it, so you write it in the usual way. A equals V times diagonal lambda times V inverse, the usual diagonalization. Uh, but then you ask yourself how big this, this, this I, the, the, the V contains the eigenvectors, so how big, this, how big this V and the V inverse are. So you compute the, the norm of the V times the norm of the V inverse, and then you try to optimize it, so you take the, the, the smallest possible, you try to diagonalize in such a way that this is the smallest possible. This is a very natural object. By definition, it's of course always bigger than one, but it can be, can be very, very big. It's uncontrolled from above, and you can easily construct examples where, 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 the, where the matrix A is a very decent matrix. Look at an order one matrix in norm sense, but its condition number is very big. Now, uh, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a basic enemy in, 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 uh, in numerical, in numerical anal analysis. And then there is a very important uh, analysis, very important tool, which was invented by Sankar very famous paper of Sankar Spielmann and Tang, which is called the smooth analysis, which says that actually the noise is good. So it says the following, that okay, maybe you have a matrix A, which has a very, very bad condition number, but if you add a small randomness to it, not a big randomness, small randomness, this one already remedies the situation to some extent. At least it controls the situation. It will, not, it, it will, it will reduce the condition number from infinity, something which may be independent, but something which is under control. So this has been a very, there have many, many recent works along this idea, this is an important thing apparently in numerics, I'm not in numerics, but, but I followed what they are doing, and, and, and the basic goal is to, to ask the following type of question, um, it's, it's also formulated as a Davis question, is that given an arbitrary matrix A, uh, can you approximate it well by, a ma by another matrix which has a relatively small condition number? So given a matrix A, which may have a, an infinite condition number, very, very big, uh, is, there, uh, is there another matrix nearby, relatively close to that, so that its condition number is small? And, uh, and the point of this uh, Sankar, Spielman, and Tang is that, as usual, that randomness helps to find this matrix. So if you, this is the usual random uh, probabilistic method, that if you don't know where to look for, then you just try to do it randomly. And, and, and that gives, actually, the best possible results. Okay, so, so this, is the, this is the other setup, and the point is in contrast to the statistics that here the, the noise is a good guy. So you would like to use the noise to improve the situation, while the first situation, the noise is the enemy, that's the, that's the bad guy. So now uh, our, our result, which I'm going to present today in a very, in a very informal terms, is that, that we find the optimal answer to this, uh, to, to, to this question. So the question is how well you can approximate an arbitrary matrix with a with a relatively or relatively reasonable uh, matrix, the matrix with relatively reasonable condition number, uh, at least it's optimal in terms of the independence. Uh, depend and in the size of the matrix. I mean, the numer from numerical point of view, there are other parameters to be optimized. So let me not go into that. 
uh, from random matrix point of view, the n is the important parameter, the size of the matrix, and everything is measured in terms of that. And in terms of that parameter, we find uh, an optimal answer. Okay, so now let me let me show you a few pictures how to think about these matrices. So uh, these are well-known questions, well, well-known pictures. So this is first about without deformation. So X is just this IID matrix, and uh, uh, and uh, the, these are the eigenvalues for n equal 50. You see the two pictures. One of them is the real situation, the other one is the complex situation. There's not much difference between the two except the usual things, what you, what you know from linear algebra. I don't know if you see the difference in the pictures. So in the real case, you see real eigenvalues. A real matrix does have real eigenvalues. A random matrix of size m typically has square root of n eigenvalues. A complex matrix does not have eigenvalues. Typically does not have real eigenvalues. That's one thing. The other thing is that the real spectrum is, of course, symmetric, and the complex is not. And also, it, it's easy to see that, that the complex spectrum is distributionally rotation invariant, right? Uh, obviously, in the real case, the real uh, axis plays a special role. But don't worry about uh, these details, it's more like the, the general picture. Uh, uh, now, if you increase the n, then, then you see these kind of pictures. And then, of course, it, uh, the picture is very convincing, but it's a very old result about the density of states of this type of IID matrices. It's called the circular law. This is the Hermitian, the non-Hermitian analog of the Wigner semicircular law, which says exactly what the picture suggests. Let me not write it up in detail in formula. It says that the, that the empirical density of the eigenvalue measure converges to the uniform distribution, the unit disk, and the convergence in the usual sense, in weak convergence, and so on. So this is the picture that we Yeah, for Gaussian, yeah. yeah that's what I meant, yeah, 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 that's what I meant, sorry, that's what I meant, Gaussian. Yes, um, <coughs> so, so these are the pictures without deformation, so now let's see some pictures when you have a, when you have a deformation D. Of course, this one will depend heavily on the, on this deformation matrix D. Uh, the precise description, let me not go into that, there is a, there is a theory which describes that how to find the spectrum of something where of a matrix of, di of type x plus d, this goes through the, what is called the Brown measure, an explicit formula for that, but let me not go through that, let me not go into that because that's not the main topic of my talk. Roughly, uh, this is the way how you should think about it, it's not very unexpected, that if you want to know the spectrum of the, of the x plus d, at least you want to know the spectrum, then it's something like that, that you take the spectrum of the, of the d, of the deformation, of the original deformation, and then you add to that something like a, like a unit disk in some, in some sense, in some Minkowski sense, it's not exactly like that, but morally it's like that. So let me show another picture how it looks like, and then, then, it's, then it's clear. So this is a very special case, <coughs> uh, the spectrum for x plus d, where d is the, the, the matrix which is diagonal, and half of the diagonal is one, the other half is minus one. Of course, the spectrum of the d is very easy. The spectrum of the d just has a bunch of delta function at minus one, a bunch of delta function at one. And then you add to that uh, d plus uh, an iid matrix. And I put in front of that a small coupling constant, which for some reason I, I denote by square root of t, to indicate the size of the, of, of, of the perturbation. Because remember, x is a standard iid matrix, so it has variance, and matrix elements have variance one. I want to scale it. I put the scaling parameter in front of that. OK, what? No, uh, not yet. I mean, T will come in the picture. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big. It can be anything. But I want to want to use the, want to have this freedom that I can scale the scale the T. And here is what you what you see. So these are the eigenvalues of D plus square root of T times X. And and depending on the value of T, when T is small, in that case actually the threshold is at T equal one. When T is small, then you see that that, that you have the original the plus minus one and one in the delta function. It's mad it out a little bit. And then t is getting bigger and bigger, then these are growing. And at some point, they touch exactly at t equal 1 in that particular case. And then if t grows, then, then, then they merge into this, this funny shape. So that's roughly the that's roughly the way. And if this goes to 0, then, then you see two small things. Yes. OK, so I think it's very intuitive what's going on. And, and as I said, there are very precise formulas, the precise procedure and formulas which describes what to do in the General case. Now let me come to the main topic, the, the, the eigenvector overlap. 
because so far I discussed spectrum, so eigenvalues, but the main topic today is the is eigenvectors. And uh, especially the especially I want to define this eigenvalue condition number, which is our, our basic object. So let me remind you that if you have an arbitrary square matrix or simplicity with simple spectrum, a random matrix typically has simple spectrum, then, then it still has a spectral decomposition, but it is funny spectral decomposition which uses uh, eigenvalues, sigmas, and it uses left and right eigenvectors. Okay, so that's the, that's the animal that we have. Here are the definitions of left and right. There are different conventions, but it's called left eigenvector. I'm using this convention for that. And of course, there is always a question of, of uh, normalization. The eigen, in this way, writing eigenvectors, eigenve eigenvectors is not unique. <laughs> so there's a standard normalization convention, which is called uh, the biorthogonal family of right and left eigenvectors, when the normalization is just that the left eigenvectors and the right eigenvectors are biorthogonal. So, so in that sense, scalar practice delta, delta IJ, we use that, that convention. And <coughs> Under this convention, we give the basic definition. That's what we call the eigenvector overlap. This is on a diagonal one. There will be an off-diagonal one later. And this, uh, this is called the script OII. Uh, that's the basic object today. And it's defined in such a way that you take the norm square of one of them times the norm square of the other one, divide the scalar product squared. Uh, the way of, uh, I write it in this way, this is completely scale invariant. But if I do the normalization uh, and impose the is by orthogonality, then of course the, the numerator is zero, or numerator, the denominator is one, so then the eigenvector overlap is just the norm, um, the, the, the product of the norm squares. So this is the object which we are looking at. Notice that, that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a good combination of the left and the right. It's not the left alone or not the right alone. This is the object, uh, this combination of product of, of norm of left times norm of right, which turns out to be the important one. Okay? Now, uh, it's easy to <coughs> basic linear algebra, but if you have normal matrices, normally it means area is star A, for is star A, particular Hermitian matrices, then, then of course you can choose the left and right eigenvectors to be the same, and in that case the, the, the condition number is one, it's completely uninteresting. For a general matrix, just by the form it's written by Cauchy Schwarz, you can see that the, that the eigenvector is always, uh, this condition number is always bigger than one. Uh, but it's uncontrolled from above, and that's the key point. Uh, the, uh, the we are fighting against something that this condition, uh, this condition, the eigenvector overlap is very, very big. This is the situation when, the, when you have, uh, you can think in geometric, and you can think of the left and the right eigenvectors are almost also almost parallel with each other, so their their norm is big, but their scalar product is small. So, uh, so the, the the for a general matrix, we don't have anything. With any, any control, it can be anything. But here is our result informally. Uh, for a typical, uh, the question is how a typical uh, random matrix, a typical matrix looks like. And uh, the claim is that for a typical random matrix X, uh, which is very, very far from being normal, but it's not as, it's not as bad as it could be. Uh, it's not pathologically bad, I would call it in that way. So more precisely, if you take, a, if you take an X plus even any deformation, deformation is allowed, so you take an IID matrix plus a deformation, any deformation, then roughly speaking, we will have the, the two-sided bound uh, on this overlap. One of them is a lower bound, which says that the overlap is roughly bigger than N. Uh, and there's an upper bound, which says that it's roughly smaller than N. So these two statements basically says that the overlap is of order N. Quantity that's the right uh, that's the right size again for a situation when d can be arbitrary so d can have a very very bad condition number very very bad overlap even infinity but we are looking at the x plus d so if d had a uh, very very big overlap <coughs> then the x helps f x uh, regularizes to some extent to the extent that the overlap of x plus d becomes a for the m and and the two sizes bound shows that this is actually the, the optimal situation. Now notice that the lower bound is in a, is a basically a sharp inequality. I will specify it from even more precise theorem, but it will be a very, very high probability sense. The upper bound is the upper, the upper bound is only an expectation, that's for a good reason, because this overlap has a property that it has a fat tail. The overlap is a random variable and it's something which has a very fat, very fat tail, it even doesn't have second moment. So one has to be careful when we talk about the upper bound, how in which sense it it is bounded from above. This is for complex or 
this we, we do for both. Okay, so now let me let me exactly show the uh, where we get this where we get this answer. What is, what is yeah, I will come to that. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean here that, uh, I mean, when I say typical ID random matrix is, is uh, measure, yeah. I mean, it's a high probability statement. Yes. But but as I say, I mean, don't take it so strictly because this is not form. There will be formulated more precisely. What's the worst upper bound you could get? I mean, take any matrix. There is no upper bound. It can be exponential. Uh, it can be. I mean, it, it can be infinity. Based practically, infinity. I can construct that. If there is no randomness, I can construct a matrix whose eigenvector over that is as big as you wish. Okay. Uh, just even well, yeah, two well, by two, you yeah. can do it. it it's, a, it's a very unstable situation. Okay. So now let me explain where this where this end comes from. This is uh, also but about outside the Hermitian case. What? What you said now, your example. Of course, of course. I mean, these are the very, very non-normal. I mean, the normal, the, we, we have to drop all this inhibition that we think about Hermitian matrices. This world is about very non-Hermitian situations. So all these phenomena are gone uh, for Hermitian case. Okay, so now, why do we expect, the, why do we expect this, that the overlap is order n? That's because for the, for the, for the Ginebra case, uh, well, then there is no, first of all, there is no deformation, and uh, the X is, uh, the, the IID is actually a Ginebra matrix. Then we have an explicit formula, and that's due to Piotr Fyodorov and, and uh, Paul and Leo Dubas. So they, they gave an explicit formula for the distribution of the overlap. It's scaled in such a way that you have to scale the overlap by N, that's the N what we are, what we are after. Also, it depends a little bit how far you are from the, from the edge of the spectrum. And then this is a conditional expectation, conditioning that you are looking at the overlap, because the overlap relates to an eigenvalue. So you ask yourself, you fix an eigenvalue at a point Z, and then you ask yourself, what is the overlap? What are the this, this combination of the eigenvectors corresponding to that eigenvalue? This is what the, I, this is what the index I really means. And then, then the conditional expectation is uh, to any, with any test function is given by this very nice explicit formula. And notice that the, that the formula is a sort of the pre-scale density, and the formula behaves very differently at, at, at zero when, when it has a very fixed, very fast going, uh, exponentially goes to zero when t goes to zero. And the other end is a fat tail, when t is large, then the tail is, is, is just polynomial with a cubic power. So informally, but there is another way of saying it. I mean, this, this, this distribution you may not recognize immediately, but this is actually a very, very well-known distribution if you take the reciprocal of that. So but informally, it says that the, that the overlap yeah, up to a normalization n is basically an inverse gamma 2 distribution. The gamma 2 distribution may be more familiar. This is the guy which has like an exponential distribution with an extra x, so it has a density x times e to the minus x. Anyway, so the point is that, that, that for Gaussian case, everything is explicitly known, and, and of course, we, you can see the scaling n, and you can also say, you can see the heavy tail be, be, uh, behavior, so in particular, there is no finite second moment. Now, uh, once you have that, and then you think about the, the general <coughs> universality picture, which is the basic question, motivation random matrix theory, then of course, the, the long-term goal on the long-term dream would be to try to prove this kind of results in a universe, in the sense of universality. So namely, going beyond Gaussian, uh, consider just an IID random matrix without, without Gaussianity, maybe even put a deformation. Is this true that this overlap, in some sense, is universal? The distribution of the overlap is universal. So in particular, this formula uh, should hold, or is it true at all whether it holds for, uh, for a much, much more general matrix ensemble? A bit of ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I was not, I, yeah, I, I, I should have, so this is, uh, read it as a complex situation, and then the real, is, the real is always a little bit different, because as I said, the real axis around the real axis, it behaves a bit different. I mean, here I just used it for the, for illustrating that there is the right, right size, and, um, okay, so now, uh, 
So as I said, the, 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 the long-term goal would be to establish this type of universality that the OII has this universal inverse gamma 2 distribution. Uh, we are very, very far from that. It's a very, very hard question. Uh, currently, what we, uh, our result what show, what our result shows that, the, that at least the order of magnitude is, is true. So the OII is of order M under very general conditions, not just in this Gaussian case. Okay, so now let me let me give you some motivation. Yeah. That's how that, that, that's how this Burg and Dubash do that. They, they, they do some very clever transformation where the, where the diagonal has it and it has some nice uh, independence property, it's some kind of tri-diagonal matrix or um, so it's, 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 a, it's a, yeah. but, but all these things rely very much on the Gaussianity as usual. Okay, so now uh, let me be, uh, let before stating this, the, the, the theorem more precisely, let me give you uh, two motivations why, why one is interested in this overlap. Uh, these are facts which are known from, from, uh, from numerical analysis. Probably they are not so much known in this community, so maybe it's interesting to, uh, to, to mention them. So there, there will be two facts which I list, and both of them are easy to, relatively easy to prove. These are not deep things, but, but show, what, what show the significance of this OII. Uh, first of all, the, the, this over, the, the square root of this, over, of, this, uh, of this overlap OII is called the eigenvalue condition number. This is usually called kappa in the in numerical analysis. <coughs> this is the one which I defined at the beginning, the optimizing the, the V and the, the norm of the, uh, of the V and the norm of the V inverse. There's another way, a more natural way of, of characterizing or defining it. It's, the, it's basically the, it's, it's simply the, the stability of the eigenvalue. So you do the following thing. For pick any matrix A, it has an eigenvalue sigma i, and then you also this is a sigma i of A. And now you perturb this matrix a little bit, uh, the small now it, the T is now small. You, you take any other matrix E, it, it's an order one matrix, but otherwise arbitrary, and then put a small parameter to in T in front of the E. So you just perturb the matrix A in a certain direction, direction of E, and then you ask yourself how much the eigenvalue, uh, how much the eigenva eigenvalue changes. Of course, it, it should change linearly in T, so you divide by T and then you take the, uh, this is not a limb soup, but I'm writing it first, you take the supremum of that, supremum over all possible deformations, you look at the worst possible deformation, and after that you take the, the T goes to infinity, T goes to zero, this is sort of the infinitesimally worst perturbation and and then and, and this is this is, this happens to be this this guy this square root of the overlap. So this is one one fact or one motivation very important of obviously the, the perturbation of the stability of the eigenvalue against perturbation. But there's another uh, identity which connects two two objects. It connects the eigenvalue of a, of, a, of arbitrary matrix A and it connects it to the to the singular value. You know, eigenvalues and singular values are, of course, not the same things. If you have a non Hermitian matrix, A it has an eigenvalues, but very often you also study singular values, which are just the eigenvalues of the A star, it's written here, or MM star. The singular values, of course, these are, these are solutions of Hermitian problems. We like them much more because they are much more stable. So now if you take the now, if you, uh, so if you, if, you have an, uh, if you have an eigenvalue of the original matrix A, which is close to some fix Z, fix a Z in the complex plane, look at the, the nearby eigenvalues, then you may expect that this eigenvalue has something to do with the, the first singular, the slowest singular vac value of the A minus Z, the, 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 the shift the matrix uh, by, by Z, and then you, you can look at the, the A minus Z. Why, why do we expect that? Well, because, because if, 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 if <coughs> sigma is exactly at Z, so if the, if, the, if the A matrix has an eigenvalue at the point Z, exactly at Z, then of course the A minus Z matrix has a, has a zero, the lowest single value is zero. So, so when, when the sigma is exactly at Z, then the lambda one is exactly <coughs> zero. So in other words, if I ask the question, what is the sigma of A minus Z? and I, I compare it with the lambda, the smallest eigen, singular value of A minus Z, then this ratio happens to be zero divided by zero if Z is exactly the eigenvalue. But, uh, but what happens if it's not, if it's a little bit away from that? And the funny thing is that there is no direct relation, apart from this obvious fact that, 
that if the singular value, if the eigenvalue is exactly at z, then the singular value at, uh, with the shift z is zero. Apart from this obvious fact, there is no direct relation, no, per, no of easy perturbative relation between the eigenvalue and the singular value. But, but it's, it's easy to prove the following relation. It's exactly again this, this condition number which characterizes that. In other words, this is the ratio as the z goes to the eigenvalue. Uh, of the uh, ratio of the, of the eigenva eigenvalue and the corresponding singular value. So in other words, it is sort of, remember that this OI is a big guy. So it sort of expresses, the, again, this instability, and it's very natural. As I said, that the singular values are more stable, uh, the, the, the eigenvalues can be much worse. These are the much bigger objects. OK, so these are two, um, just I mentioned them, two facts or two motivations. Uh, with where this condition number or its square is the um, overlap naturally uh, appear. Okay. Um, there is another, let me not do that, there is uh, those who know Bra uh, matrix Brownian motion, they also should know that, that they may know that overlap appears in the, in the non-Hermitian generalization of the Dyson Brownian motion, but let me not discuss that because I don't have much time, so let me uh, jump over that. And, and let me state the results more precisely so far. It was, it was a bit heuristic. So, so again, there are two different results, uh, upper, lower bound and upper bound. They are completely different words. They are proven different methods, also with different group of people. So yeah, they are not, not much to do with each other. So here's the precise statement um, about, the, about the lower bound. So the lower bound, again, uh, is, is formatted very generally. If we take a deterministic matrix plus an ILD random matrix. Uh, we, we do it for bulk eigenvalues. I will explain a little bit below what bulk means. One can also do it for the edge, but that's, that's heavier and we haven't done it yet. The statement is the following. Uh, for any epsilon, the, o, the probability that this OII is smaller than n to the 1 minus epsilon is very small. So this is, a, this is another way of expressing it that with very high probability, the OII is essentially bigger than n. Essentially means always at an n to the epsilon uh, multiplicative correction when epsilon can be arbitrarily small. And of course, the statement always hold as n goes to for large n, sufficiently large n. So the important thing is this is this holds in high probability. Yeah? When you choose, how do you choose your eigenvalues? I mean, how do you hold them? Or, because you, you fix a, a bulk eigenvalue, yeah. sigma i. So yeah. how do you fix it? Well, I, I will show what the bulk means. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, you can do uh, intuitively there were these pictures before, uh -huh. and the pictures in the bulk. So <laughs> you know that, that's the best way to think about it. So so here is a picture, and bulk means it's not here but here. Okay, we can I understand. But my and, my and then there is an eigenvalue here, and, the, and there is eigenvectors, and I'm saying saying something about the eigenvalue, eigenvalue overlap of the eigenvalues of that. Yeah, but my question was more the following. I mean, for for each n right side mm -hmm. of the matrix, you have n eigenvalues. So when you say you fix some eigenvalue i, right, uh, there is no quantifier right, inside your probability that says that it holds uniformly for all i inside, w w out, well away from the boundary. So no, I that's, that, that, that's what the statement meant to be. So the statement meant to be that, 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 that you take a small neighborhood of the edge Yes, the the and then, then, then inside it's a uniform statement. No. Oh, it's a uniform yes. eye. For all eigenvalues yes. inside this, okay, that's yeah. this. Yeah, this because I mean, this is what I tried to, actually it was hidden in the, way, in the formulation because it says that, you see, this is, this is in high probability. I mean, the statement is for any fixed, any i in okay, the bar. Okay, you mean these statements will give you that's about right. all of them. Okay. Yeah, that's I right. So okay, this okay. Is, that, that's why it's important that these are very high probability statements, so you can always use union bounds. Yeah, but i depends on n, so you have, yeah, yeah, have sure. some choice. Sure, but you can choose any of them, and okay. you can do them I simultaneously. See, so it's for all things inside the yeah. Okay, so now, as we already said, that the Ginebra formula showed that this is that this is an optimal optimal result, and and here I explain, but maybe let me not go through it. Uh, I explain what I really mean. Uh, uh, bulk eigenvalue. So informally is what I just said in the picture away from the boundary. Formally, one has to do it actually through the through what is called the hermitization of the matrix, so if you have, an, uh, if you have a, uh, this will come up later, so if you have a, a, a non-normal matrix D, then you can hermitize it, you can construct out of that a 2M by 2M matrix in this, in this block form, which is by, by construction is a Hermitian matrix. Uh, this is a very important tool to study non-Hermitian matrix, a well-known object. 
uh, the, the advantage of this kind of thing is that the, the spectrum of this Hermitian matrix is basically the, the singular values of the d minus z. It's a symmetrized form. And, and usually you express conditions on d in terms of the, terms of the density of states of this, uh, of this Hermitized version. So there's a precise definition, but let me not go through it, but it means uh, to be the bulk. Uh, uh, informal, it really means a, a small boundary, uh, away from a small boundary and, and, and the picture what you have seen before. Uh, okay, <coughs> and and again, I mean, this, this the, the normalization, uh, the, this hermitization is important because this also relates uh, eigen value, eigen vectors of the non-Hermitian problem to the singular vectors of the Hermitian problem. So let me uh, show it, explain it here. So if you have any matrix A, you can do this hermitization, this doubling procedure. You can take this hermitized matrix, the script A. It has, uh, naturally, it has singular values, it has eigenvalues, which are the lambdas, which are actually the singular values of the A minus C. And it has uh, singular vectors, the singular vectors again come in pairs, left and right. And if you write it in this doublet form, then the left and right singular vectors put together into a 2n vector form actually the eigenvectors of this, of this hermitized object. These are all very nice. Uh, these, are hermit these are hermitized problems, so there's a natural normalization. Uh, for this, for this U and V, I choose them, and and there's a key fact, uh, trivial, a very trivial but key fact is that which I already mentioned before, that if you choose the Z exactly to be the sigma, so sigma is an eigenvector of, of of A, so if you shift the A exactly with an eigenvector, then the non-Hermitian eigenvalue of of this, uh, which is the non-Hermitian eigenvalue of A, then the left and the right eigenvectors. And the, and, the, and the corresponding smallest singular and the singular vectors corresponding to the zero singular value, they are basically the same up to normalization. Right? Because the, the, when, when, when you have it, when, when the, when the, the shift z here is exactly an eigenvalue, then the two problems, uh, uh, the, the eigenvalue problem at zero and the singular value problem at zero are exactly the same. But once, but this is only an algebraic identity, this is true only when z is equal to sigma. And for others, is, there is no obvious relation, there is no direct relation between eigenvectors and singular vectors. Think in such a way that we are looking for eigenvectors, this is what we are looking for, but singular vectors are the guys which are friendlier because these come from Hermitian problems. I, I know much more about them, but there is no direct relation between the two apart from the z exactly at sigma. Now, this is a well-known problem uh, in the whole non-Hermitian analysis. Let me just put here the tour, which probably many of you have seen. Uh, if you ask a spectral question, for example, you try to prove the circular law that I showed before uh, for the, for the non-Hermitian spectrum, then, then basically any proof uh, on non-Hermitian matrices goes through what is called the Girkos formula, this is an identity, which relates on one side, relates eigenvalues, or rather some linear statistics of eigenvalues of the non-Hermitian problem sigma, and it relates with something which involves only, uh, only this matrix A, only the hermitized matrix. So you, you, you take the matrix, uh, you take your original matrix, you make this hermitization, you compute its resolvent, you take its imaginary part, trace, integrate, Laplacian and so on, but don't, don't read the formula precisely. The important thing on that side, what you are looking for, that's the non-Hermitian question. And on that side, whatever complicated it is, you see only Hermitian information, Hermitian inputs. Of course, it's a much more complicated thing, but, but this allows you to translate any non-Hermitian problem into a Hermitian problem. It's absolutely essential. Any proof using Hermitian, any proof about non-Hermitian uh, random matrices somewhere use this formula. But this formula is only about eigenvalues. That's a key point. And there is no analog. Nobody knows any analog of such a formula. And it's a philosophic, it's a magic formula. Nobody knows an analogous formula which would relate eigenvectors on that side, non Hermitian eigenvectors, to the singular vectors on the other side. So there is a formula which relates eigenvalues to singular values. This trace can be expressed, of course, in terms of singular values, but there is no analogous formula. Nobody knows them. If you found one, then you would be very famous, but nobody knows any of them. So there is so it's a fundamental difficulty. So so it's still a question how we could how could we pass information from uh, an information from Hermitian eigenvalue, eigenvector, because that's what we know from, from other machinery to non-Hermitian eigenvalue. Eigenvector. So um, so maybe let me let me uh, first explain a little bit what I mean by by knowing a lot about 
but what I mean by, meant by knowing a lot about uh, the Hermitian problem. Uh, I will specialize it for our situation. So our situation is again this one. You take this hermitization of the x plus b matrix at 2n by 2n matrix, <coughs> this Hermitian. You can take its resolvent. That's our basic, basic friend. And, uh, and there is something in this whole random matrix here which is fundamental. It's everything or the fine analysis starts with, which is called the local law. The local law says the following, just informally, take the resolvent of a random matrix here. Uh, the important thing is when the, when the spectral parameter is very close to the real axis, that's when it resolves the spectrum on a small scale. So the important thing is when this imaginary part of zeta, which I also call eta, then this is very small. Yeah, that's the that, that interesting regime. And then the claim is that that's what local law, there are many local laws, but morally what local law says, that this resolvent surprisingly becomes deterministic. So it's a fundamental fact about random matrix. Despite the fact H is random, it's a very fluctuating object, if you take the resolvent and you take the, uh, uh, even, even when the spectral parameter is very close to the real axis, the resolvent is essentially deterministic. So there are, there are various ways to express that. So one way to express that is that uh, there is a deterministic matrix M, I will tell you what it is. Uh, there is a deterministic matrix M so that the random G is very close to the M in certain sense, and the sense can be characterized in very, very many different ways. One way of uh, one sense is that you take the G minus M, test it against a deterministic matrix B, any deterministic matrix, and then this difference is smaller than, of course, the size of the B, that's fine. The important thing is 1 over N eta. So in other words, unless eta is very close to the real axis, so if eta is a little bit more than 1 over n away from the real axis, which is very, very close, it's a close thing, uh, then, then this difference is already small. So that means that the g is well approximated by a deterministic guy. Um, and what is this m? Well, m you have to, have to, m, 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 to find the m, you have to solve an nonlinear equation, a nonlinear matrix equation, it's called the Dyson equation may look a little bit, a little bit funny, but that's what it is. The inverse of the unknown <coughs> n equals to, the, to, the, to this deformation, the hermitization of the deformation, plus another matrix which comes from the randomness in this particular situation. This is just a, just just a diagonal matrix where you put the partial trace of the unknown object. Down. So this is a, uh, this is a, a fairly well-known uh, object, and then you can prove that, that this equation has a unique solution under certain side conditions, the usual side condition, and with a steer sensor of somebody. So its imaginary part is, is a very positive, if the imaginary part of zeta is positive. So under this condition, this equation, this nonlinear equation, has a unique solution, and, and we know a lot about them, and this is the guy which will approximate the, the, the G very well. Okay, now, uh, so this, this has been known for a long time, and there are many, many versions of that. But here is a basic observation, <coughs> which, we, which we made in another, in, a, in, the, in the Wigner context first, is that, that here, here you have this uh, error, this is 1 over n eta error, that's the natural size, so you can easily show that it cannot really be improved in general, but for certain observables, for certain types of bees, uh, they, the, the error is much better. In particular, the claim is that, and that's what we did in the, in the Wigner matrices, the claim is that if B in the Wigner matrix is, if B is a traceless matrix, trace is zero, then the error is, is actually much better. The error is better by something, by a factor of square root of eta. Eta is a small number in this, in this theory. So in general, we call them regular observables. Uh, we will, uh, I will show what the regularity means in more general situation, but the, but the basic philosophy is that for general B, uh, this is what you have, and that's essentially the best up to the center of the epsilon, but if B is a special type, a special type in particular means traceless in the Wigner situation, then the error term is better. So there is a one codimensional manifold of observable, ma observable matrices and the error term is better. So, um, so now here is the um, is the, the, the more general st uh, the more general statement uh, for general, what I just said before general observables is one over n eta, but for regular observables which are yet to be defined for regular observables you you improve by a factor square root of eta and this is very important. Now what is regular here for Wigner matrices regular was traceless in this in this theory in this deformed situation in this block matrices. Uh, regulate is much more complicated. It's basically a two-dimensional condition. 
uh, you have to uh, <coughs> something a matrix B is regular if it's orthogonal to the imaginary part of M, so it's orthogonal to the some twisted version <coughs> of this imaginary part of M. So there are two conditions, and both conditions depend on the energy. So now the the, the, the regularity is, is not, a one, not one condition, but two conditions, and more important, it's an energy dependent uh, quantity. So in particular, in Wigner case, then I said that regular is, is, is traceless, that's, a, that's an exceptional situation. Typically, the regularization should depend on the energy. Uh, let me not read this last part. Now, uh, once, you, once you catch this concept, then you can generalize it greatly to something which is called a multi-resolvent <coughs> local, that we are very sloppy. But you can imagine the following situation, that so far I was talking about a single G, I wanted to say that G is approximable by the by, by deterministic matrix M, but you can take any chain of products of resolvents and deterministic matrices. So G is always a resolvent, a random object, and B is always a deterministic matrix, and you can take this kind of long chain of products, and all these things become deterministic in the way that there is a deterministic matrix M, uh, which is uh, which there's an explicit formula for that, but it's non-trivial, it's not what you expect, it's something else, but there's an explicit formula, and then this, this, this long chain of G's at, uh, is approximated by a deterministic thing with a, up to a certain error, and a certain error has the 1 over n, so in particular is n goes to infinity, but, uh, but, the, but the spectral parameters are fixed, then it goes to zero, and it also allows you to have the spectral parameter in it, and the power of the spectral parameter is important here, so it tells you how well you can approximate, uh, how much you can go down to the real axis so that the approximation is still correct. Now, uh, in this situation, we also have this, this phenomenon that, that if B is regular, so this is, the, this is a statement for a general observable statement, meaning the important thing is the power of, of eta. But then if some of the Bs are regular, regularity was defined as two-codimensional situation, then the, then the error improves for each regular observable improved by the square root of eta. Um, and then this has been done systematically earlier for Wigner matrices, and then many, many applications of that, so let me, let me not um, go through them, I will, not, I will not be able to state them in details, but, uh, but, but here, here are applications of this whole theory. One of them is what we call the eigen, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, uh, which tells you that if you take two eigenvectors, these are now Wigner situations, take two Wigner eigenvectors and you test them, take the quadratic form, of them against any fixed observable B, then this U I B U J quadratic form this become essentially a diagonal that I J times the trace of the B. So it tells you very precisely how two eigenvectors uh, overlap uh, Hermitian eigenvectors even if there is an observable in between. And also the, uh, also you can um, there is a precise error term you can also prove that this difference is Gaussian that's what the Gaussian fluctuation. There are many other results. Let me not mentioned number. But this is an important uh, important tool to get lots of more detailed information about Wigner matrices. Uh, there are proof methods, but I don't have time to do that. And now what we do here is that we extend it now to, to the to the deformed Wigner matrices and also to the to the hermitization. That's the last thing last thing which is what we actually use here. We also the, uh, extended this theory to the to this hermitization of the of the deformed Wigner matrices. That's what we deformed IID matrices that's what we actually use for the uh, for for this overlap. So so here's the here's sort of the result uh, which is used in the overlap situation. So again, we take the uh, we take this this this, uh, her uh, this this hermitization. We are interested in its, I, its its singular vector, singular values, and singular vectors. And for such object, uh, this is a purely Hermitian problem. For such object, we look at the, look at this overlaps. So again, you have the arbitrary two eigenvectors and sandwich the two eigenvectors between any observable. And then this overlap, we, 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 we tell precisely what <coughs> it is. So depending whether the i and the j are the same, or maybe i and the j are the opposite of each other, uh, this i, i equal minus j comes from the fact that this, this matrix by structure, from the structure is a symmetric spectrum. So the, the eigenvalue at i and the eigenvalue at minus i uh, are basically the same. So um, so, so you, you, you we basically tell precisely how this, how this overlap uh, behaves as a deterministic term and there is an error term. So let me not read it more carefully. And then, and then once you have that, 
um, as you understand it in general, how to how to relate it to the to the local law. So if you are interested in the in this eigenvector overlap, this is still the Hermitian problem. Uh, how can uh, why is it to how can I get eigenvector overlaps in terms of local laws? That's that's given by this identity, this uh, spectral decomposition identity. I look at very special 2G, two resolvent <coughs> local law. I take the imaginary part of G times B, imaginary part of G as another spectral parameter times B star. And then this quantity, if you write it out in spectral decompression, it looks exactly like that. In particular, this overlap, W, I, B, W, J appears <coughs> with a certain weight, it's a double summation, with a certain weight. The certain weights are, are corresponding to the imaginary part. But you see that these certain weights, these are these this Cauchy-like uh, Cauchy -like distributions. So if eta is small, that sort of tells you the width of this, of this, distrib of this uh, weight, if eta is small, then this, then this summation is essentially <coughs> concentrated <coughs> on, a few, on a few indices i and j. So in other words, if you understand that guy, then more or less you understand that guy intuitively. So that's what, that's what we are using. <coughs> and, and in order to, 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 to identify this, we really have to, have to identify this proper regularization, which I, which I already hinted. I put it the, the final result over there. But more systematic theory behind that. So, so anyway, the, the upshot is all these things is that if you do the 2G local or 2 resolvent local or properly with the proper regularization, then you will be able to prove that this 2G, the MGB, MGB uh, is an order one quantity. And then if you look at this spectral decomposition from that, you get that the, that the overlap uh, with a certain regular observable is bounded by, by one over n. And then from this one, you can conclude, let me do this in details, and from this one you can conclude this overlap of the of the of the eigen of the of the non-hermitian eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And the reason why you can do that, and this is the, maybe the last thing what I wanted to mention here, is that our theory uh, proves this uh, this relation that the, among many other things prove the relation the G M G F M G uh, F is this funny bit, it's this 0, 0, 1, 0. So this is what you need to pick up the, the, the overlap between left and right singular vectors. So our theory gives you that, that the mg deterministic, mg deterministic is bounded by 1, essentially order 1. And then our theory tells you that this, that this relation holds with very high probability. This is back to Frederick's question. It holds for very high probability. In particular, it's true, universe, it's, it's true uh, simultaneously for all a z. That's the key point. Uh, typically, you prove these kind of things only for a fixed z first, but then if it holds with high, very high probability, then you use a grid argument, a very, a very trivial continuity argument, which allows you to do to, to, to conclude it <coughs> simultaneously. So there's a very high probability set when this relation holds simultaneously for all z. And then, if you know it, as uh, so originally you prove it for fixed z, but then, then, then you can do it with. Uh, you can you can up update this bound for, for a supremum in Z. And then once you have that, then in particular, this relation will hold also when Z is exactly the eigenvalue, the non-Hermitian eigenvalue. So in general, of course, uh, if, if you replace the Z by a random object, then, then the general, the, the local law would not hold. But in this sense, in this uniform sense, it holds. And once you have that, then, then, then then, then you can then you can replace this z by sigma, which is now a random object, but still it will because this was whole, this whole, this held with supremum, still with the random object you will also know that it's bounded. But once this z, this was the shift parameter in the, the uh, in the regular in the hermitization, once this z is exactly the sigma, if it's exactly the sigma, then the eigenvector, then the singular value, singular vectors are exactly the same as the eigenvectors of the non-hermitian. So this is the way how we go back to the, the non-Hermitian world, and then the, the bound exactly gives what you, what you want. OK, so I don't have more time, so the, 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 I'm not going to say anything about the upper bound. The only thing is that I want to mention the upper bound is a very, very different proof. Maybe let me just flash it up. It's a, it's a Wigner type method, actually. So the, uh, it, the, the method and the idea behind it is very different. So the only condition what we have here is that, uh, that that we have to assume some regularity on the on the distribution of the single site uh, entries, but only the mildest one. So we assume that the 
that the uh, square root of n times x i j, this was the, the, the single site entry distribution, is a bounded, uh, it, its density is bounded, so no other regularity. Um, and under this condition, we basically prove a, a Wegener type estimate for the non Hermitian eigenvalues. So the, the statement is that you look at the, the, look at the number of non Hermitian eigenvalues in a small domain, d, and then you take the expected number of that, this is the, the, the density, empirical density of states. And then we, we give an upper bound on this on this quantity, and the important the important thing is always with Wegener, those who know the Wegener estimate, those who know the Wegener estimate, they know that the important thing about Wegener estimate to go to arbitrary small scale. So so such a statement would not be very surprising uh, if this uh, domain D is of order, uh, if it contains a few eigenvalues. So for example, a circular law even without expectation gives a very good bound on that. And the number of eigenvalues in a small domain, but but this gives you, but there is an error always which is an order m to the epsilon error. So this kind of a circular law or a local version that is valid only, it, it, it's meaningful only if the disk, if the, the domain on which you ask the question contains at least a few eigenvalues. But the then, but the Wegener estimate is very different. The Wegener estimate has the philosophy that you go to arbitrary small scale, the density is bounded. So in particular, then the, number, the expected number is, is, is scaling linearly with the, with the volume. And, and I mean, we couldn't quite get it. There is a little of ones everywhere, but it's almost that type of result. So, so what we do, and, and, and uh, the proof method also reflects that. So, so basically what we do here is that we prove a non hermitian Wegener estimate for the IID matrices. So let me just go to the, uh, to the last slide. So, so so the, the, so the main result, the summary, the main result is that I gave an al almost optimal upper and lower bound on the overlap for a deformed Wigner, a deformed IID matrix, and then there have been very many different tools and byproducts. So the most important tool for the lower bound was this multi-resolvent local law with correct regularization, um, which also led to this uh, eigenset thermalization for singular vectors. That was one story, and the other story is, the, which I didn't have time, is non hermitian Wegener estimate, which actually relates to, to the to esti very precise TL estimates on the smaller singular values um, of, the, of, the, of the corresponding hermitization. And, and all these results hold, as usual, for, for general IID matrices. Many of the results have been known also in the, in the Wegener estimate, have been known for the, for the Geneva case with various precision, but our result is in general. But that's not how we that's not how we do it. It's it, it's going through the gear cost formula. As, um, in in the same way, I can actually study the distribution of the covariance form. No, we, we no we, we, do, we don't do um, we don't do this kind of thing. The 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 Wegener estimate is transient. Let me show one for one for me. It was here. So the the, the Wegener estimate is translated into by a gear cost formula into something which is non Hermitian. So. The, 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 the gear cost formula tells you for any test function tells you the, tells you the number of eigenvalues <coughs> in any small <coughs> so we'll uh, take S as a smoothed out characteristic function a disk in a domain and then, then, then you write up simply write up the, 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 the gear cost formula for that test function so this one this side tells me the number of eigenvalues in that disk or you can take the expectation and then I express it in terms of this Hermit I don't see I, I, I don't see that uh, that I, I apply to in, uh, I don't see even the inverse I don't see I don't take the inverse directly that's very unstable I, I never take the inverse of the of the non Hermitian matrix I, I I start with the Girko as I mentioned Girko is the optimal basic thing I start with the Girko translate the problem to the resolvent of this Hermitized thing and then I then I work with with local loads on this Hermitized object. It's, of course, I mean, the, 
Uh, of course, I mean, it's also somewhere hidden it contains this, uh, this instability that you mentioned, but it's, but it's not on that side. It's, it's always on that side. And it's always about the singular values, which are much more controllable. And do, do you have the dynamics in it? This we didn't do. No, this, this we didn't do. I mean, uh, I think it, I, we haven't thought about it yet. So we can, uh, we, can, we can try to think about it. We knew that there is Minami. I think it was too much for the moment, but we can go back to it. More questions? This is not, but this is what I said at the beginning. I, I, I was mentioning that, that that we are looking for uh, we are looking for optimality in terms of n. So I just explain that. So what what uh, Sasha was saying is that where is this guy? Uh, at the very beginning, yes. So so this was this uh, this was this remark here that uh, what what Sasha is saying is that you take a model x plus d. And then, and then we assume that D is an order one object and X is also an order one object. So we regularize it by, by an order <coughs> one IID matrix. Now, uh, many people, uh, for many applications, it's important to put a small parameter in front of the X. So imagine that there is an epsilon in front of the X. And you start and you ask the question how, how the condition number, after you regularize it by an order epsilon, how this condition number depends on epsilon. That's another absent the other parameter which you didn't put in. In that sense, and many of these people, many of these works focus on the epsilon, uh, regular epsilon optimality. Um, our work is not optimal in epsilon, but it's optimal in n. Their work is usually not optimal in n at all, and in some cases it may be optimal in epsilon. Usually it's also not optimal in epsilon. They, they usually, usually call it gamma. But, but, but for many purposes, that's correct, that for many purposes, optimizing the epsilon, optimizing the bound in terms of epsilon is probably more important than optimizing in terms of n. So from that point of view, our result is a bit orthogonal to what the, what the numerics people are doing. But as I said, this is a random, I view it as a random matrix problem. And the random matrix problem, the n is the natural parameter. No, I mean the the optimal epsilon we probably won't get. I mean we get something. Yeah. But I mean of course the sum quantifier epsilon is small but independent of n. No, no, I know that. I mean if, if epsilon is small but independent of n, then of course there is no problem. But but it's always there a simultaneous limit. So you would uh, eventually the error or the this condition number will depend. So there's an epsilon. imagine there's an epsilon here. Then the condition number will depend on n and epsilon at the same time. Because are usually both of them are some powers of n. And then that's an principle you would like to optimize both um, in the same the simultaneous way. And then optimizing both exponents, that's, that's probably beyond our method, but it's also beyond their method. So, but their method is always bad in terms of n. Um, the, in some cases, their the epsilon, uh, epsilon dependence is better than ours. Uh, but the original Davis, actually Davis question was formulated in a more, in a more general term. There are lots of things that one can ask, and this is the type of thing which we can answer very precisely, the independence, not so much focusing on the epsilon dependence. Um, one more quick question, uh, Jan. Okay, no, it's not quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you consider <coughs> your results, are basically uh, they uh, seem to be uniform uh, circle, right, inside, uh, everywhere. But if you consider a real case and conditions uh, on the real axis, results are everywhere actually. The, yeah. well, there are two bounds. So there is the lower bound and the upper bound. The, <laughs> the, the, the lower bound, which is the which most I, which I presented, these are, your, they, they, these are robust. This doesn't feel the, uh, feel the reality. The upper bound feels it. I didn't have time to do it, but let me just flash out that. So I hope I put it on the, on the slide somewhere. So yeah, so, 
So the, for the upper bound, so the upper bound is the expectation of the overlap, and it's done in such a way that you have the overlap in a small, in a small ball, the uh, eigenvalues corresponding to a small ball, and then the result what we have is different for, for real and complex. In particular, when, when x is real, then something happens near the real axis, so the error is, error is, is deteriorating at the real axis. So of course, I, I see it, yeah. And then, and then there is a special statement. Here is the statement of what we are asking. Uh, if if you have a real situation, then you have eigenvalues on the real line, square root of n of them, and there and they also have overlaps, and they and their overlaps also satisfy a similar bound. Uh, the scaling is, is a bit different, but there's a natural <coughs> scaling in this situation. In particular, the overlap, the size of the overlap in the, uh, on on the real axis is also for the n, but but it requires a different and then there's uh, some little gap which we couldn't quite resolve what happens if you are not exactly on the real line but very close to the, to the real line because yes, this, one, this one blows up when you are getting close to the real line but you didn't do it optimally so, yeah, so the real case near the real axis is 